failure for setting a screen. Because of physical play, although George Taylor just got caught with a moving screen. Izzo's dying for a moving screen. It's that dreaded moving screen. Welcome back, everybody, to another edition of the Moving Screen Podcast. I'm Brendan Quinn from The Athletic, here with Dylan Burkhart, you and Hoops. Dylan, Sunday morning. How are things? Think things are good. Uh, tournament is moving along, kind of, and here we are. It was a hell of a first round. It was a hell of a first round. Let's just hope it's a hell of a second, third, the rest of the rounds. I feel like we are in that, uh, there's some nervous energy in the room when it comes to what happened to VCU. That sucked big time. Um, but let's just hope this thing uh, keeps on keeping on, I guess. It's kind of all anyone can do and just i feel like the listeners are probably looking for some more positive energy <laughs> let's let's bring the positive energy then it's sunday morning i'm tired i'm not bringing the positive energy you got to carry the energy i got the energy it's all good man uh i got my final four mug Ooh. got my coffee i'm showered I'm wow like you yeah how, how you look like you? hell <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> so big one from michigan coming up Took care of business in the opener against Texas Southern. Um, now LSU on Monday, seven o'clock um, should be in what is. There's a lot of really good second round games. Uh, first one tipping off here at noon: Loyola versus uh, Illinois. But there's a there's a ton of sec- great second round games. This this could very well be one of the better ones. Um, so we'll touch briefly here on. Texas Southern, I don't know how much there is to unpack there, um, but we'll probably focus most of this on on LSU. So your takeaways yesterday, though, that uh, that I'm sure folks can read about on UM Hoops. What, what were your kind of thoughts on that on that game? I, I'm a little – I think there's a little reason to be nervous with how Michigan played in that game. Um, I, I think you look at it, and obviously there was a massive – talent gap there's really no comparing the Michigan wasn't good like it wasn't a situation where Michigan could play poorly and lose that game I don't think I think there was just too big of a gulf between those two teams um so it was never really a spot where you're like oh Michigan might lose Michigan's really in trouble any of that and as we saw this weekend that can happen and that comes sneaks up on you really quickly but I think if you're Michigan you really would have wanted to play better overall or just have like kind of an eight to 10 minute stretch where you played great. I don't think Michigan hasn't rediscovered that identity um, of like sort of that confidence, that edge that made them so good most of this year. And they're sort of stuck in this. It just feels very experimental to me. These last two games, they've been trying all these different lineups, trying new players. And obviously this is the spot to do it, right? You're only going to play a SWAC team once in the NCAA tournament. Like there's not practice reps anymore. So it makes sense on one hand, But I feel like it also has taken away from the idea that Michigan hasn't really gotten the right reps with what you might need to go on a deep run in this tournament, right? Like they haven't found a way like, okay, this is the new us. They haven't found that. And that's, that's scary because now you're going to have to find it on the fly. So do you think they got a little maybe too cute with playing some of the lineups that they did? Like, I didn't know if the goal was saving legs. I didn't know what, what the thought was there, but they, they clearly went to, kind of an extended route. Like those guys, like those guys are not getting those minutes against LSU. Your Zebs, your, your Terrence Williams, I don't think. I mean, they played minutes against Ohio state when it was a similar lineup construct. So I, but I don't know. This, the Ohio state game isn't, you know, if they lose that game, that's not the end of the season. That's true. Um, and I think foul trial played a part. Mm-hmm. Andy Brown came in and committed two fouls, 70 feet from the basket and had to sit on the bench. But then here's, here's what I don't get. If you're going to auto bench Sean D. Brown for two fouls in the first half, why do you sit him for the first eight minutes of the second half? So if you're going to do that, why don't you play him with two fouls? So it's just some of this stuff. It's like decisions that you would make in a vacuum in normal time, and they make sense. But with this new reality for Michigan, it's a little harder maybe to make some of those decisions and the same decisions you made during the season. I don't know. I just – there's some worrying signs, I would say. I think you would have liked to play a lot better in that opening game because you're going to have to play better. And I also would say on the flip side, 
we've seen Michigan go on runs in the NCAA tournament all the time where they played an awful, miserable game in the first round, and it was just completely forgettable. So all that can change in a flash, really. And so that's that's just kind of where I'm at with this first game, though. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could in some ways say that, like, Sean D. Brown's just overall game in that it is kind of the like ultimate microcosm of some concerns that you have coming out of it. And the fact that like of the one seeds, Michigan certainly looks the most vulnerable. Yeah. Uh, Shondi Brown, Michigan needs him to play well. And in the two games since Isaiah livers was out for the season or out indefinitely, sorry, he has, played two of his worst games of the year. And right. it was fine if Shondi Brown played a bad game in February because it was just kind of found money, right? Like if Shondi Brown played great, oh, it makes everything easier. But no one was counting on him to score 15 points or do this or do that or stay out of foul trouble. It was just sort of like on the edge, right? It, was, it wasn't going to set your whole team's performance. It would take it from a good game to a great game if Shondi Brown was hitting threes or doing this. And it was all supplemental. Um, Michigan needs a lot more from him, I think, if they're going to go on a run. And he just hasn't I, – I don't know if it's the role and, like, pressure of what he's thinking he needs to do, but he's just looked kind of uncomfortable to me, and I think they need to find that. Um, yeah. I mean, who would have thought that he would have played – what he's playing like 18 and a half minutes per game in these two games that livers was, I would have, I, I would have thought 25 at right. least easily. Right. And right. so, and that speaks to, I guess, Brandon's been productive. It speaks to Sean D struggling a bit, but I, you got to find something there, I think. And that's going to probably have to start on Monday. And, and you want to like, Sean D Brown's the one guy that you want playing in the last eight minutes of the game too. I mean, he's the experienced guy. He's a reliable guy, all that, like no offense to Brandon Johns. Right. But like Brandon Johns still does some things in key moments where you're just, you get a little cringy, right? Like you get a little worried if it's four minutes left, keep possession and the ball swung him at the top of the key. I'm sorry. You get a little uncomfortable, right? Like, um, Sean D you want a confident, like I tweeted yesterday, if one of the, one of the big uh, upsides of, of a one sixteen game was a guy like Brandon Johns, you know, seeing the ball go in, like he made a three, right. He played 25 minutes, like him getting a boost of confidence in that game was, was, you know, a really good offshoot from a otherwise useless one sixteen game. A guy like Shondi Brown doing nothing though, is like the exact opposite. Like you want a Shondi Brown playing as confident as humanly possible. Yeah. And so the Johns thing is really interesting. He's been, pretty productive. I think he's drawn like 10 fouls in two games. He's been really good at getting fouled. He's been doing a, he's been great defensively. I'd say he's what he's 13 of 16 at the free throw line over the last two games. He finally hit a three. Uh, It's just, it's a real trade off spot though for Michigan. Like there's not one Isaiah livers solved all your problems. Yeah. And now I think you're kind of looking at a defense versus offense situation. When you have John's out there, you have the size, you have the rebounding, you have, kind of the length around the rim that has made this team really good all year. And I think that his size inside is a very big difference with how Michigan defends Mm -hmm. compared to if you're going to go small with Sean D Brown. Right. So I do think that defensive impact is kind of a key part of the equation that we lose, but you're paying a big price for it because if you go back and watch Michigan's offense over the last two games, guys are just playing off of John's to the, a pretty extreme degree that we haven't right. seen this year. And that, that doesn't like show up necessarily on the box score as much, but what you're seeing is it makes it harder for Hunter Dickinson who had six turnovers because there's a really easy place to double off of. And it makes it harder for the ball screen offense because Great point. there's just so much less space in the paint and you can really play off that. And even if John's hits a couple threes, I think, if you're playing Michigan at this point, your scouting report is pretty clear. You're going to play off Johns. If he, if he hits four or five threes and beats you like, so be it. But I think you're just going to leave that to him. And that's where I think you might want something else as a secondary option. And maybe we'll see. Um, But the spacing, it's just, it's really, it's scary for a team that has had amazing spacing all year. Right. Like I just think there's worrying signs about the offense, but Johns has been getting confidence. He's, I think he defended pretty well in that last game. Uh, I don't think he's made a lot of sort of 
like slapstick defensive mistakes that he would make when he would kind of come in for like one possession at a time. I do think right. kind of consistent reps have helped him get a comfort zone there. Um, well, you can tell, I mean, by the minutes, I mean, if he were doing, if he were, his, his pants were falling down on defense, right? I mean, how, Juwan Howard's not just going to ride that. So he, you know, if he were a big vulnerability on the defensive end, he, he wouldn't be getting these minutes. So you're right. He is kind of keeping his head above water on that side. And yeah. And he, he's just a very different type of defensive player than Shondi Brown, right? Shondi Brown's not going to wall up and contest at the rim. Shondi Brown's big, strong, and athletic, but he's six, five. He's not guarding like true power forwards and Texas Southern had six, nine guys in the front court. So it's not like you could really get away with playing small. So just an interesting dynamic all around. And I don't think there's an, easy answer to it i think you're Mm -hmm. sort of just trying to get the most out of the situation as you can and minimize your vulnerabilities but that spacing is scary for me i wonder if the matchup so does the matchup with lsu lend itself to that dynamic because for those who haven't watched lsu it's basically five guys six four through six nine no one smaller no one bigger it's kind of maryland like in that way a little bit in terms of just what you see on the court. Um, Having kind of what you're talking about, maybe does that afford Michigan kind of the opportunity to kind of do a little bit more of what it wants or less of what it wants? I, I don't think there's anything good about how Michigan's defense matches up with LSU's offense. I think you have a lot of issues. I've been trying to kind of piece together a, like I have like a section in my previews where I have like five on five starters, like how the defensive matchups would go. And I've changed it like 15 times. I can't figure out what the answer is for Michigan and there's huge issues. And I don't like Johns isn't high on the list of mismatches to start with. Um, It starts really at the one and the five, I think. And there's just nowhere really to put. And the problem with Michigan is, the one and the five are the positions you're trying to figure out what to do with defensively, but they're the most important positions offensively. So the, the matchups are really tough. I mean, John's probably fits as a piece in that because LSU, they're not big, but they have length and size at the four and the five that they can do different things. But man, it's hard to figure out. I know you said you were watching some film of them as well. I don't know how these teams match up either way to be honest because LSU right. has no one to guard Hunter Dickinson so exactly LSU has a Hunter Dickinson problem and Michigan has an LSU problem <laughs> yeah I mean <laughs> LSU's <laughs> offense is ridiculous yeah it is well I mean let's just get right into it um so you know for those like the brief scouting report on LSU um it really boils down to you know they have legit pros multiple pros um headlined by cam thomas he's a five-star kid and um just a big time elite elite score 15 games 25 points or more um gets to the foul line a ton uh and makes a ton he's shooting almost 90 percent from the foul line he's like a 32 percent three-point shooter but he's shooting 40 percent in the postseason between yesterday and the sec um then you got a guy in uh trendon watford uh, kind of a six nine. He's a weird player. Um, or no, I'm thinking of Darius Day. Sorry, Trendon Watford is a. He put up 30 against uh, Alabama in the SEC tournament. He's a six nine guy. You got Javante Smart, six four guard, thousand point career scorer, forty two percent three point shooter. Um, and Darius Days, I think, is one of the stranger players I've seen. That's who I was thinking of. He's an odd combination of offensive rebounding and three point shooting. <laughs> <laughs> averages what two and a half offensive boards a game and he shoots almost 40 percent on threes is kind of a six seven thick boy uh and uh so, you know they they run up they score a ton they scored a 1.1 points per possession uh in league play this year that ranked first they ranked ninth in defense in the sec they have a passing interest in defense and they just you doing your research for this pod score the shit out of the ball it's the NCAA tournament, man. This is you're the time to, time to do it. Your little cage. So I, I lay right. out the oh, scouting report, right. and then Hold I want to get into playing style from you. I was I have some some nitpicks with your scouting report, or I just want to go through it because I think some of these guys are just fascinating. So, mm-hmm. so Cam Thomas is the he's the guy who's probably a first round draft pick. I don't like Watford and Smart are really good. I don't think they're 
really like – it's not like they're going to be lottery picks or something like that. They're guys who are kind of in the mix and they probably – They will both wear an NBA uniform at some point in their lives. Yeah. Yeah. They're more like a Isaiah Livers, Joe Wieskamp kind of pro, right? They're not – for like it's different than like a Kentucky, like, oh, these guys are all lottery picks. Sure, 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 sure. So I they're, just like, they're guys who will play in the NBA at some point. Yeah, they're guys who are going to need a raise. They're going to go get – to the draft they're going to go be a second round pick and they're gonna they'll also play in beijing yeah <laughs> and they'll get buckets in beijing i'll tell you that um watford is interesting though because yeah. well really the watford and days dynamic like i guess we can start with that because i'm not sure exactly how michigan matches up and i keep coming back and forth on this days is basically what you think of as a pick and pop big he He's not a guy who's going to create his own offense at all. He's going to spot up from three. He's going to set screens. He's going to pop. He pops on like 80% of his ball screens. So it's just always kind of that pick and pop five out. And he shoots 40% from three, but then he'll crash the glass. And basically 85%, I think, of his made baskets are either assisted or putbacks. So this is like the all isolation offense, but he's the one guy who you really have to worry about off the ball. And like my first impression of that was okay you put Hunter Dickinson on days because he's the screener in the ball screen game he's the guy you're going to worry about on the glass but then I start thinking about it more and it's gonna be really hard for Hunter Dickinson to get out on him for those three-point shots so what if you flip that around and put Brandon Johns on him Um, that makes Brandon Johns more your primary ball screen guy but he's athletic enough and agile enough to recover to those shots way more effectively than Dickinson and then you put Dickinson on Trent and Watford the trouble with that is Watford is legitimately like he runs more ball screens as a ball handler than he does as a screener so he's like a legit kind of perimeter creator in a way um that's a tough ask for Hunter Dickinson but I think you would rather have Watford shooting over Hunter Dickinson than driving and overpowering smaller players to get to the basket um Watford can make shots. Um, He can make threes. He can make pull-up jumpers, but he's really at his best when he can power his way to the rim. So I wonder if that actually might be a way to tackle that matchup. But I, I, you could convince me the other option that we haven't even got to yet. St. Bonaventure did this a lot. They put their five man on LSU's three um, Andre Hyatt and just left him wide open from three point range and just parked him in the paint. Um, The problem is I can make a pretty strong case for, Mike Smith, Hunter Dickinson, or Franz Wagner to guard Hyatt. And that's kind of your one place to cheat. And I don't know the best way to attack it. I mean, with Watford, couldn't you, the same way we talk about letting Brandon John shoot, couldn't you do that with Dickinson on him? I mean, he's 12, he went 12 for 39 on threes in conference play. That's 17 games. So yeah, he made 12 of them. He shot just over 30%, but it's, that's basically Brandon John's. So, you know, couldn't you make an eight, an argument of if he wants to put up five or six threes and he makes three or four of them, like, okay, good on him. But considering all of the alternatives, that's uh, might be a safe bet, at least starting out, right? And if he bangs you for two, you got to switch it up. Yeah, and I get that. Uh, a lot of what they'll do with him is sort of isolate him on the wing, kind of like to face up and drive from that uh, – probably like 15 feet or so. Um, I, I don't know what you do if like, you, how do you, how does Michigan guard a Watford smart pick and roll, right? Like right. is Hunter Dickinson, I guess you just drop, right? Like that's what you do is just don't even really get out and guard that and just say, okay, if you're going to do that, fine. Um, so that, I think that's the move, but I, I don't think you're feeling great about it. Um, I think like, if you think back to the Northwestern game, um, where I guess Watford is a little bit like Pete Nance in a way where he's sort of this operator of the offense and also pretty long Michigan put Franz Wagner on Nance and he did really well. So if, even if you start with Dickinson and Watford, I do think there's that option to move Franz onto him and his length could be really effective. Um, how much, uh, let's say, should Michigan show any zone? And if so, how much? So they keep doing it, right? So they have it. I haven't published my preview yet, but the line I wrote was basically, I would bet a lot of money that Michigan will run a lot of zone in this game. 
and I would not bet any money that it will be effective. Uh, LSU is really good zone offense, uh, best zone offense in the SEC. They're like 80th percentile or something nationally. Michigan zone I don't think has been very good. But just look at how Michigan played against Maryland. Look at how just Michigan likes to, likes its zone for whatever reason. And th- this is a game where there's no good one-on-one match. We haven't got to the backcourt yet. And it's a team that just isolates you over and over again. It does make sense to play zone, but these dudes can just shoot it, man. And I, I don't know. It, it's scary. But the scary. weird thing is, is that, like, they, they can shoot. They shoot a lot of them, and they can make a lot of them. They can also shoot themselves out of games. Like, they've lost by – some pretty substantial margins for the amount of talent that they have. And it's games where they're just chucking and just playing sh- absolute trash offense. So, you know, you can bait them into doing dumb which is, stuff. Which is what Michigan zone basically did against Maryland this year, I would say. Um, yeah. Maryland just sort of took shots. But no one, no one is better in the country at making awful shots than LSU. Absolutely. These dudes take – we, like we need to talk. Can we just talk it's, about Javante Smart for a second? It's like it's like imagine the shot for those who haven't watched LSU. Imagine all the shots Dwayne Washington takes and then put them all over the court. No, it's more like Chase <laughs> Adige mixed with Geo Baker, and they but they go in right. Like oh. these guys in the Big Ten take those shots and they miss them. <laughs> Javante Smart will take five dribbles into a thirty-five footer, and he consistently and he shoots forty-one percent from three-point range. That's it's ridiculous. Uh, I have a clip of him just shooting these ridiculous shots. And to his credit, and I really like this. I think this is probably one of the most like too many guards in college basketball take long pull up twos, and mm-hmm. it like it's a deep three for that. If you have that kind of range, like shooting thirty five percent on deep threes is so much better than shooting forty percent on pull up twos. And to Smart's credit, he doesn't take mid range twos. He just right. takes 30 foot threes and they go in. So it actually makes him a really good ball screen guard, but it's a little surreal to watch when you see him just dribble like logo shots consistently and they go in. Um, so zone, man, the weird thing about smart is he shot like he, he went from 32% last year to 42% this year. Yeah. Do you see the shots he's taken? I, I mean, that's yeah. not surprising at all. <laughs> I, do you, what do you think? Do you think Michigan goes zone? They have to, right? Like, I think they're going to play zone. I think you're going to see a lot of that uh, that little three quarter court, like kind of s- slow pressure and stuff like that, um, just to kind of keep them from finding, you know, their any sort of ISO offense, right? I think you kind of want them just taking hurried shots. Um, I looked it up. I mean, I don't, you know, you understand synergy numbers way more than I do, but, um, you know, l- looking at their, their offense against any level of press, it had it at 0.8 points per possession. It's 38th percentile in the country. Um, I mean, that's, that's something, right? I mean, there, there are very few like kind of glaring numbers where you say, Oh, there's a weak spot, but that's going to have to be it. I think. Yeah. Uh, those, I have a hard time with the press numbers because yeah. I don't really know what gets lumped into that. Like there's a di- big difference between a team you'll see in like the SWAC pressing and a team that just does kind of Michigan's dummy press almost. Right. Like the, do you agree they're going to do that though a lot in this game, like this, what we saw against Texas Southern. Cause they did that pretty consistently in that game too. I would think that you'll see a lot of that. Um, especially because they like to do that and fall back into zone. I feel like right. um, I, Game control tempo is going to be a huge part of this. Um, LSU is really, really good in transition um, on offense, and LSU is really, really bad in transition on defense. Um, they give up. I have a stat here. Let me see it. But they are ranked 329th in transition defense, and they allow 18 points per game in transition alone. Uh, for comparison, Iowa has the worst transition defense in the Big Ten. And they allow 12 points per game. Wow. So they their, their transition defense is 50% worse than Iowa's. Um, so there are chances to run. And if you can take their transition offense away, because they're really good at scoring in transition, that's a huge advantage. That's basically like covering John Beeline teams. If you see those stats, that would be basically just move Michigan ahead. Because 
Michigan beat teams like that over and over again with beeline system, with this transition defense, all that. I, I think this Michigan team sets up well to control the game, um, to take transition away. Michigan's pretty turnover averse. They have been good on transition this season. Uh, the bigger question for me is if they'll be – how efficient they'll be attacking in transition themselves, um, especially without Isaiah Livers, who was probably their best transition three-point shooter. What about uh, LSU's offensive rebounding? How does that concern you? I, not that much. Um, I I think Michigan has a better chance to win this game with its offensive rebound than LSU's offensive rebounding will win the game. Um, Say that again. I think I think <laughs> LSU's bad defensive rebounding is a bigger key than LSU's pretty good offensive rebounding. Um, I. LSU was ninth in the SEC in offensive rebounding rate. So I don't think against high major teams, that's a huge issue. Um, Michigan has a lot of size. I think all the issues that they cause spreading Michigan out is what you really have to worry. They were ninth in the, in the SEC in offensive rebound rate. Yeah. But they're 61st overall. Um, That, I mean, offensive rebounding is numbers are pretty weird at this point in, major conferences they're all pretty low and there's not a lot of variance in them at least what i've been noticing lately right like i, I want to go back and look at this in the off season, but i feel like the average offensive rebounding rate is just getting so right low because part of the reason lsu's transition defense is so bad is because they crash the shit out of the offensive glass um you know and michigan has been susceptible in a couple games like illinois Last, texas southern texas southern illinois purdue um, you know, those were, those are the best two offensive rebounding teams in the big 10 and they, Illinois had 36% offensive rebound rate. Purdue had a 40% offensive rebound. Purdue had 20 offensive boards against Michigan without a guy who's, you know, the traditional center, the way, kind of the way that, uh, LSU does other than the seven foot ED kid. You know what I mean? I mean, and Travion Williams is a pretty good offensive rebound. I, yeah, I know, but he's like a, but he's an undersized guy. I think that's lower on the list. I think one issue we haven't talked about is I think this is an awful matchup for Mike Smith on both ends of the court, right. and I think Mike Smith is Michigan's most important player, you could say, at this point. Um, mm-hmm. LSU is going to switch everything in ball screens, and that I get. I mean, that's really hard as a small point guard when a team switches everything and they're all kind of six, five or taller. Uh, Ohio state did that in Indianapolis against Michigan. And there were moments where Michigan got inside to Hunter, but there are also a lot of moments where it just kind of took Michigan out of everything. Um, So that that's a risk, I think. And that's the one area where like, it's just kind of how LSU plays and they're not necessarily that good at defense but it's just a weird matchup against Michigan and I worry about Mike Smith in that spot I agree I'd also say there's the potential for the flip side of LSU like I said passing interest in defense these guys are laissez-faire it is a lot of half-assed kind of going through the motions and Mike Smith is a guy who sees holes who sees windows who can hit these little kind of you know these little gaps and if you're not right, if your body positioning's bad, if you're playing half-ass defense, like he can find those windows, right? And and if he's playing that way, and if LSU is is kind of playing that type of defense, it can be the opposite. It could be. Like, I you know what I mean. Yeah, I just worry about the matchup, um, especially when Isaiah Livers isn't. Because LSU will kind of just randomly help off shooters and just sort of do their own thing, and. That's deadly when you have knockdown shooters, but it's not necessarily – it's not going to have the same cutting edge if you're passing it to Brandon Johns or Terrence Williams or something like that. So Eli Brooks, Franz Wagner – Franz Wagner was passing up a lot of threes against Texas Southern. Uh, He needs to just shoot the ball. Uh, If Michigan's going to win this game, he needs to be looking for a shot. He needs to really be aggressive. So I I do see – and I think – there are other areas where Michigan can attack out of switches. Uh, Hunter Dickinson needs as many touches as he can get, and he needs to just go up strong and finish through these guys. Uh, I, LSU doesn't have size. They have a big guy who plays – like he's played 30 minutes all year, and 
Will Wade said he might play in this game, but he's not necessarily very good. Uh, Dickinson should be able to dominate. Um, fouls will be huge, though. If yes. It like it all sort of unravels. LSU will play guys with two fouls often. Um, Michigan won't, and Hunter Dickinson foul trouble could swing this pretty quickly because I think his size and scoring inside is really the one area where Michigan can really attack against this team. And that's where you worry about Dickinson defending guys um, like Watford, oh, like who are going downhill on him, right? Because we've seen him pick up guards on switches and kind of wall up on them. But it's different when it's he's checking a guy who's 6'2". He just has to stand with his hands up. Moving your feet against a guy who's 6'9 and strong, driving on you, that's when you pick up fouls. You and can't just wall up on him. That's the risk. Uh, right. And you're probably not going to get in foul trouble as much guarding days. He's not a post-up guy. He's not an ISO guy. But you can just bury threes. And if he makes three of them in the first half, all of a sudden you're down 12 and – the game's kind of in the danger zone. Um, mm-hmm. So I don't know. What would you do with Franz Wagner defensively in this? I just, he's the X factor. He's Michigan's best defender. I yeah. I don't do you, know. Do you put him on Cam Thomas? I don't. So I think you just go straight up with Smith on smart and Brooks on Thomas. Um, I like, yes, yeah, smart can shoot over, uh smith but if he's going to beat you with 35 footers he's going to beat you with 35 footers like he's going to shoot those over anyone uh and i think eli fits pretty nicely to guard thomas Did you where, hide smith on the hyatt kid that's what i thought about but he's six six athletic can get on the offensive glass does he post up at all i don't i mean he doesn't really do anything so that. yeah that's an option i i would you rather hide hunter dickinson on him though Hunter Dickinson on who? Hyatt. That's a good idea. Or does Franz Wagner play free safety and help on everything? Uh, all the isolation. Are they going to switch on everything? I would assume they'll switch. Because if they're switching on everything, they're just going to try to switch into Mike Smith ISO all day. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's the problem for Michigan, and that's why eventually you're going to just go zone. I think. Um, exactly. I it's just I keep coming back to the zone, and uh, that's a. It's not a great proposition. Not, it, of all the things Michigan did well this year, I don't think you want your season to come down to your zone defense effectiveness. But I think that's kind of where we're at. Or, like this game's going to be out there. I could see a blowout either way. I could see a kind of Ohio State style game in the '90s where it's just buckets for everyone because no one knows what to do to stop the other team. Uh, so it could be I that had- kind of game too. I had a basketball person who I greatly respect. So not me. Not you. <laughs> say it's either a Michigan win or LSU wins. Or LSU wins or Michigan wins by 20 plus. Yeah, it's just it feels like one of those games, right? right. It's not a normal. There's nothing normal, right. really. It's not like they're going to play a back and forth balance 62 possession game and just execute. It's going to be. Either all this shit works for one team or nothing works, and it gets ugly real quick, I think. Yeah, and like, and the thing is, I'm sure that we've properly scared the shit out of Michigan fans with this preview so far, but like, at the same time, like, you know, LSU lost to Georgia last month, um, and it, Michigan... Get Tom Crean shade out of here. <laughs> Michigan. Um, you know... They do have a ton of experience, like, and they can. I feel like there are dynamics of this game that they can control, and the key is going to be using your discipline and your your style of play and frustrating the shit out of LSU. And it's going to be, you know, keeping them to um, one shot per possession and keeping them, you know, taking bad shots, like goading them into bad shots because they'll do it all day. If, if, if you keep that door open for them, um, it's going to really need to be a, a game of kind of execution versus um, kind of talent. Yeah. And that starts with the transition. I think mm-hmm. like Michigan can, Michigan won't win this game just because it wins the transition battle, but it can't win without winning the transition battle, right? Like it can't let it be a 75 possession game where they're just running up and down the court. Like if you go back and watch any of that, that Alabama 
LSU game in the SEC. T- they're just like walking down the court and firing up threes. It literally <laughs> looks like open gym. So, but I think you underestimate you. It's easy to underestimate or forget just how well Big Ten teams do control games, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I so I do think Michigan will be able to do that. Um, and then it just comes down to how well you can guard one on one. It's it just sucks for Michigan because with Isaiah Livers, they would match up really, really, or a lot better, I would say. Um, like Isaiah Livers is the perfect guy to kind of guard Watford in a sense. And I, it's just tough. Um, Does it worry you that they really haven't played that many high possession games since early in the season and that the ones that they have, they hadn't looked great, right? It's, no, because the, the, mo- the most recent examples are what Texas Southern and well, what I don't know. Yeah, I mean the Big Ten's what lost it is. to Minnesota, right? Texas Southern is probably actually you really wanted to have Texas Southern and then LSU or Mount St. Mary's and then St. Bonaventure. Like mm-hmm. in that sense, it kind of helps. Um, that's yeah. a decent prep. Like it's kind of prep you would do if you were scheduling in November and you knew you were going to play some up tempo team in your preseason tournament. You try to get a buy little, game. A little free scout team there. Not bad. Yeah, so <laughs> that helps a bit. Uh, I honestly think it's a bigger change for LSU. How many teams has LSU played that want to keep the point. game in the 60s, like the tempo in the 60s? I, that's way more foreign, I think, for a team to adjust to than, oh, they're not going to guard us in transition. Like Michigan, like they'll just take shots and make shots. I don't think that's a huge issue, but I could be wrong. Um so that's not really where I worry. I just the the one on one matchups are tough for a team that just basically plays one on one. I LSU's defense is a huge out card though, man. Like this defense is worse than Iowa, worse than Ohio State, worse than all these kind of offense first teams in the Big Ten. And like, there's going to be chances to score. Um, it just comes down to I think for Michigan, you got to make threes. You're going to get open threes. LSU allows a ton of threes and. Somehow teams are only shooting 30% from three. It's I don't see any reason for that. I just think it's maybe, I don't know, the SEC can't shoot or teams are just not shooting against them. So, I, I don't know. What do you make of – do you think any factor of playing this game in Lucas Oil, where Michigan played last week, really struggled to shoot in that week, but it probably helps to have experience under your belt playing there compared to playing your first game if you're LSU? Uh, I hadn't thought about it. Uh, how much of an advantage? I don't. I don't know. I mean, somewhat, I guess, in, in terms of comfort level. Um, but I mean, when you look at the way LSU plays, I don't know if they particularly care. I feel like you could put them, you know, in a small gym, big gym, outside, inside, doesn't matter. They're just going to go and chuck up shots. And if they go in or not is the, is the well, that's, question. Yeah, I mean, the shooting <laughs> numbers were really bad in those early Lucas sure. Oil games. And those Javante Smart threes are deep enough to catch a draft when they're up, up there for so long. So who knows, man? I, I definitely don't think it hurts. And yeah. I do think it could help – a bit. I, I don't know. This is just going to be a fascinating matchup. I don't, it's, it's hard to really pick just because they're so, both teams are so contrasting, right? There's things that they should both like, and there's things that they should both be pretty scared of. You want to get into picks? Ooh. Or do you want to keep breaking this thing down? I don't know. Do you have anything? Le- do you have anything left in your up, notebook? I, I just looked up the, you brought up an interesting point about, um, tempo in the sec and that there's very few comparables and really the only slow teams so quote unquote slow teams in the sec uh, aren't particularly good texas a&m which barely played this year uh mississippi state and ole miss ole miss is the only team that had a winning record in the league and you know the only they only lost lsu by three in the sec tournament a week ago so, and that was a 76, 73 game. And I would imagine that's kind of probably where Michigan wants this. I think, I think that's right? probably about right. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, and it is, it's just the different styles of the league really is, it's just hard to figure out how those play out, but Michigan has fared well against 
SEC teams in the NCAA tournament over the last decade, right? Like Texas A&M or Tennessee or all these teams that kind of come in with this, like they're talented, but they don't really play. Like the Big Ten style, I feel like has done okay in those kind of matchups. Yeah. Do you think there's anything to, or am I overreading anything where it does seem like LSU kind of has this, they've got a little bit of fearlessness to them. They've got a little like, they've got good, healthy swagger to them. And Michigan, like kind of to your point early on, like you you probably wanted them coming out of that game over Texas Southern feeling really good about themselves and ready to be like, all right, let's go get, like, let's go get it on versus LSU. I don't know if that's the energy kind of coming out of that, that, team right now what do you think or am I just completely making all this up which could be fine I mean I don't know and like usually we'd be able to like go talk to a team exactly. before a game like this so exactly. I don't really know I based on how LSU plays they do not lack for confidence I mean no <laughs> but they're gonna get shots up and they're gonna see what happens like I don't think they're worried about that they and they obviously got in that little pregame scuffle with Alabama before that game like mm-hmm. they're clearly confident uh I at the same time I don't think I don't think playing poorly is just a complete deal breaker for Michigan headed into this game, right? Like it could give you motivation. It could give you like, there's, I don't know. It says I'm more worried about the fact that they maybe haven't found the combination on the court of what works than maybe the emotional or confidence. Like, I think you could say at points late in the season, they were maybe fat and happy a little bit. Um, I don't, they're certainly not going to be feeling that way now. They're probably going to be hungry to say, Hey, let's prove what we can do this without, Isaiah Liver. So I, I, don't, I don't really read into that that much, but hard to say. Like, LSU didn't play great against St. Bonaventure. St. Bonaventure just played pretty terribly. So you make a shot to save their lives. Yeah. 8-10 looking pretty rough. I don't All know. Right. Easy. Easy. I don't with know the, if the, the shade. on-court or back office product is worse than the 8-10 <laughs> at this point. <laughs> um, does LSU's three-point defense, is that number a product of – I mean – their three point defense is pretty good. Um, well, is that is that number a product of its league and competition and the games that they played, or are they doing something on three point defense that concerns you? Because you know, on one hand, it's you watch them play and say, "Hey, you know, if Michigan can get can turn this into a barrage of open shots, you know, they can bury team. They can still bury that team that way, even without Isaiah Livers, right? Wagner, Brooks, Smith, like these guys can all still shoot the shit out of the ball if you if you give them open looks." Um, what do you think there? So the, it's the kind of the age old question of, I guess it's the last five year question of is three point volume versus accuracy on defense and what's luck and what's skill. Right. 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 The argument is, or the kind of conventional wisdom at this point, analytics wise is that your defense controls three point volume and mm-hmm. three point accuracy is sort of, luck is the word that's used right it depends on who you play it depends on how they shoot oh like through open three-point shots or semi-contested three-point shots are not usually affected by the contest as much as just kind of how the person shoots um if if you can shoot a jump shot off the catch it it, it's not so much about the defense it's more about just you um does it go in so lsu's ranked 327th in three-point volume So they allow more threes than basically anyone, but they're ranked 14th in three-point accuracy, uh, 29.6%. To me, that says they're due for some sharp regression. Uh, It's crazy to me that they're ranked 123rd in defense with that sort of three-point luck. Mm -hmm. But, like, maybe there's some secret to the madness. It seems like chance. And I'd say if they're going to lose whenever they lose, if it's Monday, if it's later, team's going to hit. 15 threes against them. And that's going to be that for LSU. Um, But if you look at their game logs, a lot of their losses weren't really like, it's not like they just sometimes give up 15 threes and they lose. I don't really see a trend in, Oh, all their losses look the same, which I I, I don't know what to make of that, but Michigan's going to get three point shots. They just have to make them. And I know like Will Wade is everyone's whipping board, but like, it's worth saying like he can coach like the way that they play is intention. Like this, it's intentional what they do. And it, it looks insane sometimes when you watch him play, but like, this is what, this is what they are trying to do. Like this is kind of his brand of basketball and it's working. I mean, he's I mean, turned, <laughs> they get dudes and they play this way and they can win. 
Yeah, the last three years, fifth in adjusted offense, fourth in adjusted offense, twelfth in adjusted offense. Right. And it's it's sort of like a high school offense with all conference players, right? Yeah. So it's like we have the best players. We don't have to do anything extraordinarily fancy. We're just going to spread the floor, spread you out, and beat you one on one. And that's really hard to guard. It, yeah. Most people don't run that offense because it requires that you have the best players on the floor. Um, so it's sort of a catch twenty two in that sense, right? Mm-hmm. It it's not like Mich- it's not like Michigan's going to see a bunch of offensive sets they've never seen this year, right? It's just oh, they're going to run a horn set, they're going to run that. It's very basic stuff, and Absolutely. it's just to get to the right matchup and then attack, and that's basically it. Um, guard your yard. That's that's the game plan, right? We we can't get out of here without mentioning the fact that I'm pretty sure. LSU and Will Wade knocking out Michigan of this tournament is pretty high on the list of worst case scenarios for the NCAA. <laughs> I think they're worried about far more at this point. Well, outside of all matters of health and safety, uh, level the, of- the, the, the Will Wade storyline in the Sweet 16 is not ideal for uh, our friends in Indianapolis. Level of concern regarding the fact that St. Bonaventure was in that 8-10 game. St. Bonaventure played LSU yesterday. Yeah. It's been del- like that's that's something also that's at play here, at least to an extent. Um, you can't ignore it. It's it's risky. And, I mean, it, for all we know, it seems like something that would pop up next week, to be honest. Like, I think it's much more likely to impact the winner of this Michigan-LSU game than it is to impact the Michigan-LSU game. But I don't think you can rule it out, and that's – kind of where the whole tournament's at at this point it is harrowing yes when you think of like potential scenarios of who was with who was near who and how could this play out and so on and so forth but that's pretty morbid let's not go there too far uh tournament's been my pick is michigan i i I really I don't know. I mean, I, I've talked to myself. I picked Michigan initially. Then when I was watching LSU, I talked myself out of it. And now going back over it, um, I think the dynamic of Dickinson and discipline can get Michigan a win here. I think there's a very real chance that Michigan loses. Like, I think it's pretty Absolutely. close to a 50-50 game, more than you would say. I don't know why. It's like it's like a five-point number right now. That seems... I, I would put it at like Michigan giving one or two. But I think I'm going to stick with Michigan as a pick, uh, mostly because of how well they played against Maryland this year. Um, right. And I think that's – like they don't play with the same tempo. They're probably one of the slowest teams in the country. But sort of that switching, mismatch, whatever, no size inside. Like I do think that Michigan was really able to attack them on offense in the half court. Mm -hmm. Um, Like Michigan played probably three of its five best offensive games against Maryland this year. Um, I think that Dickinson inside against the team that like go back and look at who the best post up center was in the sec and get back to me. Right. Like they haven't seen anything like Dickinson. And I think that's really the advantage for Michigan. Um, And it it comes down like there's just I think we said this, but there's no margin for error. Hunter Dickinson has to play well, has to stay out of foul trouble. You're not going to get bailed out by something else. I also like this staff on a 36 hour prep. That's fair. I mean, it's their first, you know? it's their first yeah. 36 hour prep in with the stakes. So it'll be like that's the kind of the whole undertone of this is it's really the first chance to evaluate mm-hmm. Juan Howard and his staff in the NCAA tournament because we haven't had that yet. Yep. All right. Well, that'll do it. I think this was good. Hope uh, everyone out there enjoyed it. Um, If you would be so kind to leave us a review in the iTunes store, uh, that would be tremendous. And make sure you are subscribed to UM Hoops uh, for all of Dylan's postseason coverage. Make sure you are subscribed to The Athletic for not only my work, but all that good stuff from my colleagues. And of course, be sure to tip your bartenders and servers.